Let's begin with a word of prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful time that you've given to us to come together to pray and to learn to pray. Pray that you'll make this time a very useful time for so many of us that are here as well as for those that are joining us from everywhere. Pray that the Spirit of God will lead us and guide us in prayer. Help us to pray according to your will and your plan and purpose for our lives and for this world. To accomplish your goals through prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please turn with me to Psalm 79. Psalm 79. I want to read to you from the NIV version. Psalm 79 in the NIV. O God, the nations have invaded your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have reduced Jerusalem to rubble. They have left the dead bodies of your servants as food for the bird, birds of the sky, the flesh of your own people for the animals of the wild. They have poured out blood like water all around Jerusalem, and there is no one to bury the dead. We are objects of contempt to our neighbors, of scorn and derision to our, those around us. How long, Lord, will you be angry forever? How long will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not acknowledge you, on the kingdoms that do not call on your name, for they have devoured Jacob and devastated their homeland. Do not hold against us the sins of past generations. May your mercy come quickly to meet us, for we are in desperate need. Help us, God our Savior, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and forgive us our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Before our eyes make known among the nations that you avenge the outpoured blood of your servants. May the groans of the prisoners come before you with your strong arm preserve those condemned to die. Pay back into the laps of those, our neighbors, seven times the contempt they have hurled at you, Lord. Then we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will praise you forever from generation to generation we will proclaim your praise. The psalm actually describes the destruction of Jerusalem, the defiling of the temple, the slaughter of the people, and the most obvious historical setting for this is the period following the destruction of the city by the armies of Nebuchadnezzar, if you remember the Babylonian king, in 1587 BC. Right after all that happened, the period following the destruction is the period about which this psalm is written. Now, Psalm 74 seems to be about the same period of history. Psalm 74 we covered, and it is also something that looks like uh, about, the context is about the Babylonian um, invasion and destruction. Now, therefore, the two Psalms, Psalm 74 and Psalm 79, are somewhat similar, similar in many ways. And there are many expressions that are common to each, both 74 and 79. The Jews seem to regard this Psalm as describing the classic destruction of the city and the temple by Nebuchadnezzar. And the Psalm, interestingly, is recited at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem on Friday afternoons, even today. Every Friday afternoon, on the Wailing Wall of Jerusalem, they recite this psalm. And this is also used as part of the liturgy of a day of fasting, which commemorates the temple's destruction. So, it's a very significant psalm. If they are praying this every Friday, at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. And uh, if they are keeping it as part of the liturgy for the day which commemorates the destruction of Jerusalem, this psalm is a very significant psalm, very important psalm. How can we outline this psalm? 
a simple outline, verse 1 to 4 is the initial lament, where he laments about what has happened to the city and its people, right? Secondly, it is followed by prayer for deliverance and for judgment on the people's enemies, uh, that is, the Babylonians. Prayer for God's deliverance and for judgment upon the Babylonians. All right. Now, let's look at the first portion of this psalm. Now, you can, you know, when, when we studied Psalm 74, I already commented on Asaph, the psalm writer's distress over the destruction of Jerusalem. And in that psalm, if you remember, Asaph walked through the ruins of the desolate and abandoned city. He tells God, look, this is what they've done. Eh? This is where they entered and broke in. They set up their military uh, standards over there. Then that is where they attacked the uh, city. After they burned the temple, look at those ashes. That's all that is left. He's showing God uh, as he was pleading. He was showing God all the damage that was caused. Then as if the damage to the temple was not bad enough, they went through the whole land to destroy every place where God was worshipped and destroyed the places of worship. They've done it. Do you see? Do you care? That's how the psalmist prays. That's how the psalmist uh, writes that psalm. Pointing to God about all the damages, all the destruction, the invasion that has happened. And he says, do you see it? Do you care? Now, both psalms ask how long this terrible state will continue. Is it to go on forever or will there be an end? Both the psalms, Psalm 74 and Psalm 79, ask God to rise up and destroy those who have destroyed Judah. And both the psalms look forward to a day when people of God will be able to praise him for his mighty acts of deliverance once again. All right. But there are differences also between the two psalms. In the earlier psalm in Psalm 74, Asaph, the psalm writer, seemed to be very troubled about the temple that the Babylonians had destroyed, the place of worship, the place where God met the worshippers. He was very disturbed about that. In Psalm 79, Asaph is chiefly concerned of for the people. In 74, he's concerned about the temple. There also Asaph only is writing, and Psalm 79 is also Asaph's psalm. Here he's concerned for the people, for those who've been killed, those bodies lie in the streets with no one to bury them. And uh, he's concerned about those who were taken as prisoners and those who've been left desolate after the terrible destruction and slaughter. Now let's read it to you, verse 1 to 4. O oh God, the nations have invaded your inheritance. They've defiled your holy temple. They've reduced Jerusalem to rubble. They've given the dead bodies of your servants as food to the birds of the air, the flesh of your saints to the beasts of the earth. They've poured out blood like water all around Jerusalem, and there is none to bury the dead. We are objects of reproach to our neighbors, of scorn and derision to those around us. Now, you must realize that what Jeremiah prophesied in Jeremiah 7.33 has actually happened. Jeremiah already prophesied to the people of Judah that this is going to happen. It is because of their disobedience, their sins, you know, that they were going to go through all of this. And it is a terrible disgrace when you're not able to even bury your dead, you know. It's one thing that people are killed, but not even able to bury the dead is a terrible disgrace. So Jeremiah prophesied about a terrible calamity and disgrace that was going to happen to the people of Judah. Now, I don't think any of us have witnessed any kind of disaster in this magnitude, in this level, you know. This is a different level. Bad things happen to us 
all sometimes. Uh, we get sick or someone close to us dies or some fire destroys something, some accident happens and so on. So many things happen that bring some calamity and distress into our lives. But in this case, it seems like everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. Everything that could be destroyed has been destroyed. The destruction was a total destruction of a civilization. Just think about it. It was a political destruction because the nation no longer existed. There was no king now for Judah, no counselors, no people in authority, no army, completely left desolate. The destruction was also economic in nature because the land was devastated. They could not earn a living anymore. They could not trade. They could not do agriculture. No one to buy anything that may be produced there and so on. The destruction was also social in nature. Families were wiped out and there was no one who had not lost a husband or father or mother, or wife or children in the conflict. Death all over. Every family experienced some kind of a loss of some important loved one. The destruction was also religious because the temple was destroyed. The place of worship is now gone. It has been desecrated. And um, worship has ceased throughout the land. So it's political, economic, social and religious. Destruction of the entire civilization. A lot of us have experienced some kind of uh, loss but this is tremendous loss. This is loss beyond anything that we can imagine. The whole nation, whole civilization, whole culture has been decimated, destroyed. And every house there is wailing, there is crying, there is mourning, there is fear, there is terror and so on. Now we've all experienced, not on this level, but on some level, some kind of thing like this. But how do we cope with these things when, it, when they come our way? This psalm doesn't give us an answer in words to that question. But the psalm itself is the answer. The psalm itself gives us the answer without giving us the answer in words. That is what is interesting about this psalm. You know, you look at the first two verses, it says, O oh God, the nations have invaded your inheritance, they've defiled your holy temple, they've reduced Jerusalem to rubble, they've left the dead bodies of your servants as food for the birds of the sky, the flesh of your own people for the animals of the wild. Very interesting here. You know what is interesting? After all this happened, look at the way he talks about what has happened? Nations have invaded your inheritance. He looks at himself and the nation as God's inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have reduced Jerusalem to rubble. They have left the bodies of your servants as food for the birds of the sky. The flesh of your own people for the animals of the wild. Now, in other words, the people have suffered a great calamity. Yes, they have failed, they have sinned, and this calamity has come upon them. But nevertheless, they are the, still the people of God. They are still God's people. They belong to God. That's why he uses the word your, your people, your own people, eh? your inheritance, your temple, your servants. Uh, your own people, and so on. Uh, that is very interesting. Uh, look at the confidence that he shows there. No matter what happens, no matter how great the calamity is, no matter how great the loss is, how great the disaster that they're experiencing, he is believing that they still belong to God. I kind of like that, you know. I think that is the approach all of us must take when we experience bad things in our lives. When calamities happen, when things like this happen on any level in our lives, sometimes people immediately begin to talk about God as someone else 
then that they don't belong to God, and that God doesn't love them anymore, God doesn't care for them anymore, or anything like that. No, we cannot look at it like that. We are God's own people. We belong to God. He is our Savior. He is our Lord. We are His. You know, no matter what we face in this life, eh? sometimes we face many things because of our own failures. Sometimes because of our sins or because of some evil in this world. There are evil people in this world. That's why things happen also. So many reasons for things happening. It can be you, it can be the devil, it can be evil people in this world. It can be a lot of things. It's a complicated matter. One Jewish rabbi asked the question and it became a very famous book. Can bad things happen to good people? That's the question he asked. The book sold more than a million copies, I think. Can bad things happen to good people? A lot of people answer that with the answer saying, no, bad things happen only to bad people. Only good things happen to good people. But wrong. That is the whole message of Job. Job is showing us that he was an upright man, a good man, a godly man, who worshipped God, who loved God, trusted in God and so on. And bad things happen to him, you know. But Job clung to God. If you look at Job's story, <laughs> with all that happened to him, with the terrible disaster that happened in his life, he never went away from God. He kept, keeps coming back to God. <laughs> Comes, keeps coming back to God. That's amazing, you know. I think that's what Christians should be like. Because you must understand that life on earth is very complicated. You cannot simplify things like this, you know. You can't say bad things happen only to bad people, good things happen to good people always. No, it's not so simple. It's not that easy. It's very complicated because we live in a fallen world. We live in a sinful world. Things are complicated. There's good and evil in this world. So you cannot simplify things. So in the midst of the complications and the complexity of life, the thing that you and I can do is we can hang on to God. That's the only thing that you can do. Eh? Because we don't understand everything. We don't know the reason for everything. We don't know why God allows some things in this world. You know. Sometimes you will wonder you know, whether there is a God, you know, because so many bad things happen. So many evil people do so many evil things. It seems like nobody is there to question them. Nobody is there to put them down, it looks like. They just keep doing whatever they want to do. And you wonder, where is God? <laughs> well, <laughs> you don't understand everything. I don't understand everything. And what do we do? How do we cope with this? We need to hang on to God. Hold on to God. Don't quit your faith in God. Because God is God. Things happen for so many reasons. But God is always good. God's plans are always good. God will never fail you. God will never forsake you. Ultimate victory will be yours. So you need to hold on to God during the difficult times. And that faith in God will see you through the difficult times. Job went through all of that. That's why the Bible says in the New Testament, eh, it says, consider the end of Job. <laughs> the end of Job. It doesn't say consider the beginning of Job. The beginning was problematic. <laughs> the, the, the book of Job, the beginning chapters are very problematic. <laughs> Here is a good man living uprightly and all kinds of bad things happen to him. And then some guys come and they philosophize about this. You know, one says one thing, another says another thing. And they all seem to say, you must have done something bad. That's why this has happened. You'll find that happening in your life. When something bad happens, they'll say, oh, you must have done something wrong. God is punishing you. You must have sinned. That's why God is punishing you. <laughs> if you'll only repent, everything will be all right. Well, maybe sometimes, yes. Sometimes, yes. Yes, we have sinned sometimes. But not all the time. Sometimes things happen even when you've not done anything wrong. <laughs> all those counselors come. They all talk all kinds of philosophy. They have their own philosophy. 
they seem to ask the same question, how can bad things happen to good people? So there must be something wrong with you, you must be a bad person. That's why bad things are happening, that's what they're implying. And then finally, God comes on the scene. God comes on the scene and then God says, who are you to question me with all of those things? Where were you when I laid the foundations of this earth? Where were you when I hung the heavens and the stars and the moon and all that? Where were you, man? Where do you know? What do you know? You know very little. You are a finite creature. You're finding yourself on this earth at one point in history and time, and that's it. But he's eternal God. He knows everything. You belong to a certain time, just a few years on this earth, 70, 80 years, 90, maybe 100, nothing more than that. But God is there forever and ever. And you're trying to figure out why things happened. How can you understand? That's the ultimate end of what God is saying to Job. Then Job says, I will shut my mouth. I've spoken things that I did not understand. I did not comprehend. I will shut my mouth eh, because I've been wrong in speaking some things. And when he shut his mouth, he found that God gave back everything he lost twice as much. Twice as much. Everything. Double. <laughs> Double of all the damages that was caused to him. He thought the damage was so much. When God compensates, it's something amazing. Double, double of everything. Eh? Even the insurance company won't give you that much. That's why they have such big buildings. Because they earn a lot from you. <laughs> they won't give you so much. But God gives you double for your loss. Double for your loss. So, the, the lesson that I learned from this psalm is this. Look at all the things that they're going through. Babylon is, uh, has come in, they've destroyed the temple, destroyed the people. Not even, there's not even people to bury people. People's bodies are laying all around. Blood is shed all over the town, all over the city. City is destroyed, temple is destroyed, desecrated. In every home there is death. In every home there is wailing. People have been taken captive. But, look at the way this man prays. He says, oh God, the nations have invaded your inheritance. He calls himself God's inheritance. He calls his nation as God's inheritance. He talks about the dead bodies of your servants, he says. He says, the flesh of your own people were thrown to the animals of the wild. <laughs> He's not saying they threw the people to the wild. He's saying the flesh of your own people. He looks at him and the entire nation and the people of Judah as belonging to God. Do you belong to God today? <laughs> Do you belong to God? I think that's a very good way to pray. Very good way to pray. Let us pray. Let's take time to pray. No matter what you're going through, what the trouble is in your life, recognize and acknowledge the fact that you belong to God, you are owned by God. You're God's own possession. You're God's inheritance. Even if all kinds of bad things have happened to you, you belong to God. The way you should come to God in prayer is just like the psalmist, claiming to be his inheritance, his child, his son, his daughter. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. What a privilege it is. What a privilege it is, oh God, to know that the maker of heaven and earth is our Father. Our Father. We are his inheritance. That we are his people, his own people, his covenant people. Oh, we thank you, Father. We thank you. We are your own, oh God. We are your inheritance. We are your people. Sometimes we've done wrong. Sometimes we've sinned. Sometimes we are not so perfect. Sometimes 
things happen because we are not so perfect. Sometimes things happen because of other evil people that is there in our lives. Sometimes things happen because of the devil and what he's trying to do against us. But we don't know. I pray that you'll help us to keep a focus on who we are today. Of who we are today. That each one of us, no matter who we are, no matter how wrong we've gone sometimes, no matter how much we've failed in our lives, no matter whether we are perfect or not so perfect, <laughs> how imperfect we are, doesn't matter. We belong to you, O oh God. Just like the people of Israel belong to you by a covenant, we belong to you, O oh God. We are yours. We are your inheritance. And ultimately we will see a victorious end in our lives. You will even change us, you will even transform us, you will even get us back to yourself. You will even change us and help us to leave our sins to follow you more perfectly. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you, Father. We are yours. We are yours and nothing in this world can cancel that. We are born of God. We are in the family of God. We are in the family of God and nothing in this world, nothing that we do or nothing that anybody does can change that fact that we are your children. We rest assured today on that fact that we are your children. We are your children, O oh God. We thank you that we are your children. Thank you, Father. All right. The next stanza is from verse 5 all the way to 12. You know, actually 5 to 8 is one stanza, 9 to 12 is another, but we're going to put it together because the whole thing is a prayer of Asaph to God. Eh? So since it's a prayer and it's, it's quite a, from, it goes all the way from 5 to 12, we're going to put it together. Now, look at verse 5. Look at how he prays. How long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? He asks different questions. <laughs> the first question he asks is, how long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? How long will your jealousy burn like fire? Now, this is the same question that's asked in Psalm 74 also. That psalm is also from the same context of Babylonian destruction. Yeah. And it emphasizes the word forever. Will you be angry forever? And the next stanza asks in verse 10, why should the nation say, where is their God? Now, both these questions are appealing to God for help eh, for his people and appealing to God to punish their enemies. They're asking for help and asking God to punish. Asking God to help the people of God, asking God to punish the enemies. That's what these prayers are about. And there are four important questions, confessions or statements in these verses. Four questions, confessions or statements. The first one is, how long will this punishment last? That's in verse 5, right? How long, Lord? That means how long will this punishment last? The Babylonian captivity happened as a result of their own sin and, the, and it's a punishment for their sin. And this is a big question. And this is a question that dominates Psalm 74 also, which is written in the same context of Babylonian invasion. And this is often the question asked by God's suffering people or persecuted people. They don't complain that their treatment by God is unjust. These people know that they are sinners. It's their sin that has brought them to this. They know they've repeatedly sinned in thought, word, and deed, they know that God has been merciful to them so far. They know they have suffered much less than they actually deserve. <laughs> they deserve far greater suffering. But they know for what they have done, they are only suffering very little. God is merciful, but still they are hurting and hoping that this punishment will not go on forever. How long, O oh Lord, is their question? The martyrs in Revelation 6, verse 10, 
talking about the martyrs in the end times. It talks about how they will ask the same question. How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge your blood? It's a very important question. How long? I'm sure some of you have asked the question when you're going through things. How long? How long, Lord? How long should I put up with this? How long is this going to last? People living in persecuted situations, countries and places where they're experiencing tremendous tribulation and persecution, asking the question, how long? How long? St. Augustine, very interesting person, very important person in the Christian history, asked this question. St. Augustine was a man who lived in sin, in very open sin in his life. When he was 19, he already had a child, um, illegitimate child, at 19 years of age, and lived with a woman. And uh, that was not the only woman he was into that kind of a thing. He was a very uh, sinful person. And God began to deal with him at a certain point in his life. Just before he got converted, God was working in his life. He was coming under conviction, hearing some preaching and so on, coming into convention, uh, conviction. He went and stayed in a friend's house, friend's uh, estate, sitting in a garden. And uh, he wants to follow God. He's convicted of his sin. He wants to give himself to God, but he's unable to. He's unable to leave the life of sin and commit himself to Christ. He was into lusting and sinning and so on, and he was unable to kick that, and he was unable to overcome that. He was battling with himself. How can I follow God like this? So he's battling with this. He wants to come to God, but his sins are holding him back. And so he describes it like this as he sits in that garden of his friend's estate. He says it like this, his own words. I cast myself down, I know not how, he's telling God, under a certain fig tree, giving full vent to my tears, and the floods of mine eyes gushed out an acceptable sacrifice to thee. And not indeed in this, these words, yet to this purpose spake I much unto thee. And thou, O Lord, how long, how long, Lord, will you be angry forever? <laughs> He's actually quoting Psalm 79, verse 5. How long, how long, how long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? Then he quotes verse 8 also. Remember not our former iniquities. And as he was praying like that, crying out to God, how long, how, how long will I battle with this? I want to kick this habit. I want to finish with this. I want to live a different kind of life. Help me. How long should I go on like this? As he was crying out like this, he heard a child singing the words, tole lege, in Latin. That means take up and read. Tole lege. A child is singing tole lege, which means take up and read. And immediately after this, he goes and picks up a Bible that was there in the garden and opened it at random just opened it out of the blue and came upon these words from Romans 13. Romans 13, verse 13 to 14. Remember, he's a very sinful person, lusting after women, living with a woman at 19 years of age, already having an illegitimate child, that kind of a person. And he opens to Romans 13, 13 to 14, and it says, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy, rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Amazing. Just open the Bible out of the blue and here he's reading a verse and that says, let's behave decently as in daytime. Not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Clothe yourselves 
with the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't think about how to gratify your sinful desires or sinful na- desires of the sinful nature. He was touched. See, the word, see, we are born again by the word of God. The word comes in. It's the word that created the heaven and earth, right? God said, let there be light, and there was light. This word, I think God sent this word to him. When you normally read it, it doesn't happen. But when God is working through that word, that word, the words that he reached, got into him, and something happened, the chain of sin was broken that day. This man who lived such an evil life, his mother used to cry, it seems, because of the ways of this young fellow. Just a teenager, but living in such sin. Will not listen to anybody. Will not budge. Mother used to pray and cry. Nothing happened. That day when the word of God came to him like this, the chain of sin was broken forever. He became Saint Augustine. Can you believe that? A guy like that became Saint Augustine and he is the greatest teacher after the first century the apostles taught, he became one of the greatest teachers of Christian doctrine. Later on when the Protestant movement comes up, Luther, Calvin, all of them, they base their teachings on what Augustine taught. What Augustine taught about God, man, sin, salvation, all of those things. Anybody writing about anything in theology about these subjects cannot go without quoting Augustine. Augustine was a tremendous man of God. He became the bishop of a region there later on. It's called Saint Augustine. Lived in the 4th and the 5th century. End of the 4th century and beginning of the 5th century. Amazing. How long is the question that he asked? (laughs) He's had enough with sin. For a time he's been under conviction. For a time he's battling his own sin and sinful nature. How long, how long, he asked. God showed him that it's not forever. When God intervenes, it comes to an end. So I want to tell you, no matter what you're going through, the time will come when you'll be able to praise God once again in victory. You may be experiencing difficulties, challenges, problems, sorrow, sadness, battling through so many issues. You're asking the question, how long? How long? And the Bible says that it'll never be more than you can bear. God will make sure that things don't get so bad that you cannot bear them anymore. No. God will intervene. God will help you. And God will bring you through. And you will praise God. You believe that? Eh? Let's pray. Let's thank God because God will come through in our lives. It won't be long. It won't be long for God's answers to be made Uh, manifest in our lives. No matter what you're waiting for, what your cry is about, you may be crying how long and God is near. His answers will come in your life. You will never be disappointed. He will not let you down. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for that assurance for each one of us, O God, that when we face difficult times, when we face struggles, when we face the attacks of the enemy, when we face battles of our lives, we know that it may seem like long, but it will not be forever because you are a God who comes there in the right time, right time, in the right way, rescues us, delivers us. Oh, we thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you for your rescue and thank you for your deliverance. Thank you. Thank you for coming in and intervening in our lives at the right point in our lives, oh God. You will never let us down. You hear our cry. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. I pray that today, no matter where people are and what they're going through, whether they're here or over there in their houses, I pray 
that you'll minister to them. Minister to them strength, hope, encouragement, assurance today that everything will be all right. As they are crying out, how long? I pray that the assurance of God will be given to them today. It will not be forever. When God intervenes, it will be beautiful, it will be wonderful. If you can change a man like Augustine and make him a saint, if you can change the worst sinner and make him a saint, if you can take Paul and make him a great apostle, you can do anything. You can do anything, O oh God. We pray for people that are seeking the salvation of their family members, that are crying out to God, how long? I pray that they will have the assurance, not forever, that God can do great things. God can do great things. We pray for people that are going through various battles of life. May they have the assurance today that God will intervene, that God will make it right, that God is great and God is wonderful. When he intervenes, everything changes. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Secondly, they're crying out to God saying, it's time to punish those who punished us. <laughs> These Babylonians have come in and caused great calamity. They're crying to God saying, punish those who punished us. Verse 6 and 7, look at that. Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not acknowledge you, on the kingdoms that do not call on your name. For they have devoured Jacob and devastated his homeland. Verse 10, why should the nations say, where is their God? Before our eyes, make known among the nations that you avenge the outpoured blood of your servants. Show them that you will avenge the lives that have been killed and so on. May the groans of the prisoners come before you with your strong arm, preserve those condemned to die. Pay back into the laps of, the, of our neighbors seven times the contempt they have hurled at you, Lord. <laughs> They're praying against the Babylonian saying, pay them back seven times what they did to us. Whenever we read a psalm, in psalms, a lot of psalms are like this. It's praying for God to punish God's people's enemies. Now, whenever we come to a passage like that, I know Christian people are very disturbed because the New Testament says, forgive even your enemies, right? <laughs> so how do you reconcile this? Here the psalmist is crying out for vengeance. <laughs> but New Testament says, forgive your enemies. <laughs> now, you should remember two things. One is, we make a mistake in this way. There is, trying not to be very harsh with those who practice evil, we become too lax sometimes. We take it for granted sometimes. We don't want to be too harsh against the, those that do evil. So we go to the other extreme. Uh, we become too kind and let them do all the evil and uh, do not worry about justice that must be done. At least here, you can say that the Jewish people were interested in justice. They're saying they've done this, what they've done to us is wrong. It's wrong to kill people and throw them on the streets with no one to bury. It's wrong to destroy their homes. It's wrong to destroy the worship place. It's wrong to destroy a land, a country. Especially God's people, God's covenant people. It's wrong. It's wrong. They want justice. That is why it is right. It is not a prayer of hate. It is a prayer for justice. Is there a God? Will he do justice? Uh, is there justice? You know. Should sinners be punished? That is the question here. Secondly, we need to remember, regardless of the attitude we take, justice is going to be done. <laughs> you know. Justice is going to be done. Now, you may be very kind to the 
evil people and be nice to them and let them go. But justice is going to be done. God is going to do justice. One day they're going to answer God. Eh? God sees the evil and he will punish it. The Bible says the blood of the martyrs will be avenged. Have you read that in Revelation? It will be avenged. Every good and evil deed will receive their appropriate rewards. We live in an age of grace. God is gracious. And that is why when people do evil things, we wonder, where is God? Why is not God doing something? <laughs> Sometimes I see people do some things, I wish God would throw, send some lightning and strike them down. <laughs> I've thought like that. My God, look at the evil of these people. Just send some lightning and strike them dead, Lord. I've thought. But God is gracious. Thank God I'm not God. I would have sent it a long time ago on some people that I know. <laughs> but God is very gracious. He's not like us. He's patient. He's long-suffering. But that doesn't mean that he's endlessly patient. He's long-suffering, but that doesn't mean that there is no judgment, that there is no hell, there is no punishment for evil deeds that are done against God's people today. Martyr's life will be avenged. Every evil done against God's people, God's work, God's plans and God's purpose will be avenged, the Bible says. The prayer is not necessarily just a hateful prayer. It can be that because of what they've done, they may have hated, but it's not just the hatred. It's just the seeking of God's justice. That's what is happening here. That is why they're praying, saying, pour out your wrath upon the nations that do not acknowledge you, on the kingdoms that do not call on your name, because they have devoured Jacob and devastated his homeland. That's what they're saying. They've touched God's anointed. Pour out your wrath, wrath O oh Lord. Look what they've done. <laughs> Pay back into the laps of those, our neighbors seven times the contempt they've hurled at you. Very interesting. The contempt they've hurled at you. Because these invaders, these Babylonians, Oftentimes they speak like that. You read in the Old Testament, they speak like that. Let's see which God will save you. Nebuchadnezzar, remember? He built a big statue and said everybody should worship that, otherwise I'll throw you into the fire. Eh? If you don't worship, let's see which God will save you. <laughs> he told the Hebrew children, let's see who, whether your God will save you. Who's your God? What are you talking about? Will your God save you? So the people are praying, saying, pay back into the laps of our neighbors seven times the contempt they've hurled at you. Some people will open their mouth and say, let God strike me dead. Let God put a curse on me. Let's see what your God will do. <laughs> I pity those people that talk like that. I pity those people that talk like that. You hear people talk like that every day. Let God strike me dead. Let God put a curse on me. As if they're so righteous. How could God ever do something like that to me? That they're so truthful, they're so genuine and all that. Nonsense. Every sin will be judged. Every sinner will be judged. Every sin will be punished. That's what the Bible teaches. Amen. So that is what the prayer is all about. That's what the prayer is all about. They're helpless. They're not able to do anything, but they're crying out to God saying, God, you punish them. And I believe today that God will punish everyone that acts against God's purposes. That's for sure. That is for sure. That's why I pity people that act against God and dare to challenge God and come against God's purposes. All right. Th thirdly, forgive us our sins. Verse 8. Do not hold against us the sins of past generations. May your mercy come quickly to meet us. We are in desperate need. Help us, God our Savior, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and forgive our sins for your 
namesake. Forgive our sins. Now, every true prayer should have within it the confession of the worshipper's sins. Because we're all human beings. Many times when we come, come and pray, there's sins to confess also. And it must be done. Because we have sinned. We've done wrong. It's always better to confess our sins, right? If you sin, confess your sins, the Bible says. And he's just and righteous to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So every prayer has this part of the sinner confessing sin. You remember the Pharisee and the tax collector coming in prayer. The Pharisee says, huh? he talks about himself, how good he is, how, how, how much he prays, how many times he fasts every week and how much he gives in tithe, in, you know, and all that. And uh, right next to him standing a tax collector who was considered a terrible sinner in those days. He prays saying, Lord, help me. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says in that parable, this man who prayed saying, Lord, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner, will go home justified. In other words, he will go home just as if he had never sinned. He will go home clean, blessed by God, forgiven. But not the other guy who praised himself standing before God. What nerve he's got to praise himself standing before God that he prays so much, he fasts so much, he gives so much tithe and he did this, that. And he's also got the nerve to say, I'm not like this Gentile. That's how he prays. I'm not a sinner like this Gentile, he says. God says, no, that's not an acceptable prayer. One of this psalm's most important features is that this psalm acknowledges the sin of God's people. The psalm is not saying, see, a lot, lot of times people don't want to acknowledge their sin. They'll always justify themselves. Uh, they'll always try to justify themselves. One of the things we need to do, God, do, to, do before God is when we come before God, we need to be truthful. We need to acknowledge our sins. Uh, there is an acknowledgement of the sins of the fathers. Look at that. Uh, that is why Jerusalem was destroyed. They realized that. So they are talking about the sins of their fathers. Do not hold against us the sins of past generations, they are saying. There is an acknowledgement of people's own present time sins. Because verse 9 says, Deliver us and forgive us our sins for your name. That's their sins they're talking about. Their previous generation's sins, their sins. They've suffered the destruction of their entire civilization politically, economically, socially, and religiously. They've suffered in every way. But they do not ever say, open, open their mouth and say that they did not actually deserve it. They know they deserved it. They deserved this and much more. <clears throat> Instead of excusing their sins, which is what a lot of time people try to do, the psalmist acknowledges them and pleads for forgiveness. Now that word forgiveness, forgive our sins, you know? Forgive our sins. <laughs> if you just check that word forgive in Hebrew language, you know, it immediately shows up. The word forgive means cover over, pacify, propitiate. We've been talking about it on Tuesday nights, right? <laughs> the wrath of God is upon the sinner. So forgive means, Lord, let your wrath be averted. <laughs> means to cover over, to atone for sin. and atone for sins by legal rituals. In the Old Testament times, there was rituals, there was sin offering that was offered. When a leper was cleansed, 
they need to go through a ritual to cleanse the leper. It is all talking about how sins are removed and sins are forgiven. When the Day of Atonement came, they brought an animal, killed it, shed its blood, took the blood inside the Holy of Holies and presented it before God as proof that punishment for sin has been rendered upon the substitute, the animal. It was all dramatically played out in the Old Testament. That is the kind of atonement they knew. But now the temple is not there, no sacrifice is being offered, the temple has been destroyed. How are they going to receive forgiveness? No temple, no sacrifice, they're without it. They're asking for forgiveness. They know that it's not the blood of bulls and goats, it's not just that temple from where you get forgiveness. You get it from God through His Son, Jesus Christ, whom He would send later on into the world to die and shed His blood and so on for our sins. Forgive us our sins, they pray. And then fourthly, they pray saying, glorify your name. There was a great preacher named G. Campbell Morgan in London some time ago, back in the 1940s, 30s and 40s. He talks about this psalm, he says there are three great themes in this psalm and one of the great themes is the passion for the glory of the divine name. He says the passion for the glory of God's name. Because verse 9 says, help us, O God, our Savior, for the glory of your name. This is a wonderful way to pray because they're not just saying, help us, because we need help. They're saying, your name must not be spoiled. For the glory of your name. God's glory is the reason why we are blessed. The people of Israel were blessed because of God's glory. God wanted to glorify himself, show who he is to the world. That is why he blessed the people of Israel. So that nations will see Israel and know the living God. He wanted to make them a showpiece. The glory of God. They need to live for the glory of God. We need to live for the glory of God. So when we pray, the glory of God must, must, must be our big concern. It's not that our need must be met, that our problem must be solved, but God's glory must be seen. Those around us must see the glory of God. That's the essence of successful prayer. The glory of God. Our salvation brings glory to God. Our deliverance brings whole glory to God. Our healing brings glory to God. The fact that we don't die but we live brings glory to God. The fact that we are blessed brings glory to God. It's the glory to God. It's not what our need is. It's the glory to God. Shall we all stand up together and pray that God will be glorified in every way in our lives, through many ways, as our needs are met, as our problems are solved, as our prayers are heard, as answers are given. The greatest thing is that God is glorified. God must be glorified in our lives. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. Oh, we thank you for you do not share your glory with anyone. The benefits are ours, but the glory is yours. We enjoy the benefit of healing. We, need the, we enjoy the benefit of salvation. We need healing. We need salvation. We need for our problems to be solved. And when it is solved, when healing comes, when deliverance comes, we are blessed. We are blessed. We enjoy the benefits, but glory belongs to you. Through that, you are glorified. Through that, those around us see the glory of God. Oh, your glory is magnified before people. Who you are, what a loving God you are. What a great God you are. What a promise-keeping God you are is seen by all the people. Oh, thank you, Father. Help us to pray in that manner having concern for the glory of God, being very passionate for the glory of God, the passion for the glory of your divine name. Oh, your name must be glorified. Your name must be lifted up in this nation, in this nation, in this city, in this area. Your name must be glorified and lifted up 
magnified. Your name must be lifted up in our families, in our homes, in our surroundings, in our workplaces, in everything that we are involved in. Your name must be lifted up. Your name must be glorified. Help us to be passionate about the glory of your name, O oh God. May your name be glorified. Help us to live for your glory with a passion for your glory. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Help us to order our prayers in that way. Everything we ask is for your glory. Everything we receive is for your glory. Every good thing that happens to us is for your glory. Help us never to forget it. We give you all the glory. May you be glorified. May your name be glorified in our lives. We pray your blessings upon people, O oh God. Bless them immensely in spirit, soul, and body, in the work of their hands, in every area of their lives. Just as we heard today, maybe there are those that are crying out, saying, how long, God, being in trouble, in distress, in problems. I pray that you'll give them the assurance and the hope and the encouragement and the surety that everything will be all right. And that when answers come, it'll be to your glory that Jesus will be magnified and glorified in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.